Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the final video in our uh, Faith and Spirituality interview series. This week, I am joined by our very own Father Roy Herberger. Um, as I just said, this will be the final of our um, interviews. We thank all of you who have joined us for the previous four. We are very grateful for everyone who's decided to come join us today. And hopefully, as we close off talking with one of the priests who serves our Newman family, we'll learn a little bit more about faith from someone with the perspective of what it's like to be inside, so to speak, that faith. Uh, someone who knows what it's like to be a teacher of that faith, uh, to be a pastor, to be someone who's directly ministering to those in the pews who are charged with practicing that faith every day. So I hope that in speaking with Father Roy today, it will help everyone uh, be able to appreciate the other dimensions of faith that are sometimes not so evident to those of us who aren't serving as priests up at the altar. Uh, so Father Roy, our guest for this week, is a longtime priest, not too long though, uh, still very youthful, is a longtime priest who has been in the Diocese of Buffalo for his entirety, uh, the entirety of his uh, priesthood. He has worked in various social justice efforts, um, focusing on prison ministry, which he still does today, uh, focusing also with homeless ministry, and then also being a tireless and uh, outspoken advocate for uh, the poor in the Buffalo area, uh, for the most vulnerable, as Pope Francis has urged Catholics to, to pay attention to, uh, to give care to, and also a critic of some of the hypocritical practices that can be seen uh, in the diocese. Uh, Father Pat often remarks that he knows a couple of saints from his class at the seminary, and he always shares that Father Roy is one of them. So we're very privileged. We're very happy to have you with us today, Father. Uh, how are you doing? Doing fine. I've avoided the virus, fortunately, and uh, but have been affected by people that I've known who have it or who died because of it, and especially that frustration of not being able to visit them in their dying days and their, be with them in their final hours. But otherwise, I have been doing fine. Thanks. Good. Um, so, Father, we're talking about faith and spirituality today, and I thought I'd just start by asking. What do those words mean to you when someone says faith, when someone says spirituality? What does that make you think of? Well, the word faith, of course, especially from a scriptural standpoint, reminds me that it's believing in something that is not seen, but is real. And has been a part of my life ever since my childhood. Belief in God and not trying to uh, picture God the way I think I think God should, you know, be, uh, but to be open to who God is and how God works in our lives. Um, spirituality, of course, reminding us that we're not just physical beings, but emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and spiritually to be a whole person. So with spirituality then being something that encompasses so much of us, that goes beyond uh, just what's purely physical, um, how is it that you see spirituality as being something that you can work at? Uh, what do we do that counts as spiritual if it's something that's so all-encompassing, if it's something that uh, speaks to so many of the different parts of us as humans? Well, of course, I look to others who share their spirituality, their journeys, and try to learn from them. Um, and some of the, the great saints of old, as well as Pope Francis, and you know some of the women and men who are such great symbols of and opportunities for spirituality, and not just within Christianity or Catholicism, but other religions as well. And that's something I've learned through my many years, not just as a priest, but as a human being. So many other religions have so much to offer and that I can learn so much from them and to apply it then to my own personal life. So I have to keep growing. I have to be open. I can't just say, well, oh, I've got all the answers. It's all set. I've got it made. No, but you know, what's new today? <laughs> and how today am I going to realize this aspect of who Roy is? So I spoke with Mike Beato a few weeks ago. He was the first person I interviewed and he also mentioned a lot this idea of being open and of wanting to learn more about uh, his faith every day. I want to ask you, though, Father, 
if you're approaching faith and spirituality from the perspective of being open to, to new experiences, to new perspectives, if you see yourself as someone who needs to constantly be learning, how does that affect how you teach, how you preach? Uh, when people look to you uh, sort of a figure with answers, um, if you're always trying to look more for those answers yourself, how does that affect how you respond to those questions? Well, even in my homilies, I try to encourage people as they are listening to say, well, this is something I want to share with you today. Now, maybe next week I'll have something more to share with you. But don't think as you're sitting there in, not the pew, of course, at the Newman Center, but on your chair at the Newman Center, don't think that, again, that you have reached a certain plateau. There's nothing more for you to learn, no new ways for you to grow in the awareness of God within your life and what God is expecting of you and what you should be expecting of yourself in relationship to other people. One of the things I've always appreciated about how you celebrate Mass, Father, um, when you come to the confidi or the penitential rite, you always give us concrete examples of the things that we may not have done as well as we should, that we may have failed at. You give concrete examples tied into the Gospels. Um, that kind of seems to me like one of those ways in which you're trying to push those of us in the chairs, as you say, to to think a little more, to learn a little more. Is that something that you try and do in all the parts of the Mass? Oh, yes. In fact, in the penitential, right, that's something that's always been a frustration for me, um, especially if there's a deacon involved, and I don't have a chance to speak to the deacon before Mass. But if I do, I say, now look, when I say let us pause and recall how we have sinned, we don't give people two and a half seconds <laughs> to pause and think. And then all of a sudden, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. No, I give people, you know, a minute or whatever just to say, yeah, what about, you know, the last, you know, couple of days? What about since I was at the Eucharist, you know, the last time? What have I failed to do? Or what have I done that really I'm not that, you know, proud about? But to give people a chance, and even before communion, before communion, we say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. That's another time for people to admit their sinfulness, their shortcomings, their failings spiritually, their relationship with God, and to say, yeah, I admit it. I'm not trying to skirt the issue or run away from that. And so I do ask for your forgiveness. I know I'm unworthy, but I know your love is so powerful. Your mercy is so gracious that I still feel as though at this moment, now you have touched me with your forgiveness. So let's talk a little bit about that merciful, that loving, that forgiving God. Um, I know there's a theological answer to this question, but I'm curious about what you would say personally to it. Who do you think God is, Father Roy? Well, God to me is obviously, as I say, the source of all that is, but not a, a thing. I really do believe personally in a relationship with the great I am, with the great, as they would say maybe in the Jewish tradition, the other, um, uh, I and thou. And, uh, and so I, I just feel as though that is so important for me to be able to say this, this God, this this source of life and of love. You know, Israel is part of my life, and God has allowed me to be a part of God's life. And I even try sometimes to avoid always just saying, He. <laughs> you know, because as we know in scriptures, you know, God, you know, is not, you might say, a, a great personification of humanity, and uh, that He's so much more than what we would ever understand and doesn't necessarily have a sexuality, but that we, from a, a paternalistic society from, for generations and generations, you know, try to think, well, he must be a male because, you know, he's powerful. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I just want to say I'm open to whoever, you know, God is and how I can relate. Another thing I want to ask about, um, when... When we look at how God is presented in the Old Testament, there's, there's physical presence. 
there's the cloud that shields the Israelites when they're freeing from the Egyptians. There's there's the Ark of the Covenant and then the sanctuary and the temple when it's built. And you had mentioned being close to God. So for Christians lacking these, these touchstones, so to speak, in the physical world, um, except maybe the Eucharist, where do you think Christians find this same physical presence? How are Christians close to God like you were speaking of? It's what we're celebrating at Christmas time. Emmanuel, God with us. And I believe that God maybe is working through a fiery bush or a cloud or an ark of the covenant, but through a Josh, a Roy, a Mary, a Shirley, a Bob. God works in very powerful personal ways through human beings. That this is the ultimate because the opportunities are always there. You, know, you don't have to go you know, out to the desert. You don't have to go to you know the city, to the temple. But just look next to you, look in front of you. You know Who is that person? And is God trying to say something to me through her, through him, You know that maybe I'm not aware of? Uh, and so to me, the, the signs or the objects, the opportunities that God uses now is of the human beings. So with this incarnate view of God, uh, us finding God in other persons, let's reverse this. How do we be God or show God to other people? Um, how is it that we're the presence of God? What kinds of things do we need to do to be like that? Well, if we say that God's love, God is a person whose love is unconditional, is our love unconditional? Mm -hmm. Well, I love you if, or I love you when, or I love you to what degree, you know, I'm comfortable with. No, so we have to get beyond our comfort zone and to be able to say, I just have to love you. Maybe not like you, <laughs> but I have to love you. And to be able to say, like, what can I do? Is there anything I can do to make your life more peaceful, more loving? Is there anything I can do to help you to grow in an awareness of God in your life or a better, deeper, you know, relationship? And so it's like I have to be just as forgiving, just as merciful. I remember when Sister Karen Klimczak was murdered by one of the men in the halfway house that, that she had for the inmates when, when they're released from prison, a home that she and I had started many years ago. And the blow to me when I found out that she was murdered by one of the guys she was trying to help, a big challenge for me and also for her sister, Sister Jean, when the two of us went to the holding center and faced the murderer within a foot or two of each other across the table, and we could both say, I forgive you. And it took a lot, but it was real, and it was sincere. Can we really forgive the so-called unforgivable? Uh, can we go beyond ourselves and that's, again, what Pope Francis is so powerfully, you know, aware of and tries to preach, you know, about racism, you know, against, you know, social injustice. And, you know, so many people are still hung up. I mean, in the, you know, 2020, to be hung up by the color of a person's skin, you know, or the language they speak in. Well, you know, Americans, they can speak English. Well, you know, but yeah, maybe your great-grandparents didn't. They spoke German or Polish or Italian, you know, and it took a long time before they were able to learn English, and they had to survive somehow with, with their own language. But we forget all that stuff. We just think that everybody should be the way I am today, you know. And so it's, again, to be that open, that supportive, that encouraging, accepting. So I mentioned at the beginning, you have sort of a, a very different perspective than many of the people I've interviewed because you are the first priest that we have. Um, oh. So I'd like to ask a little bit about how that has played into your own spiritual life, but also how that affects um, how you see yourself as, as a Christian, as a Catholic, as, as a faithful believer. So let's start way back at the beginning, Father Roy. <laughs> um, when you were younger, uh, what was faith like to you? Did you always know that you wanted to be a priest? Was this something you discovered later on in life? Um, what was faith like uh, growing up as Roy Herberger? 
Well, I think obviously in the very beginning, uh, of course, I became an altar boy when I was in third grade. And because we lived only two blocks from the church, I always got stuck with the seven o'clock mass in the morning during the week because I could just walk up there no matter what the weather was like. Uh, religion, mass, and all that, it was, I don't know if there's anything like uniquely special to, oh, I want to be a priest. But just, oh, well, I'm that age, you know, I can do this job. You know, I like it hang out with some of my buddies, you know, whatever. Uh, go to church because it was mom and dad say it's time to go to church. And it was had to say no. But believe it or not, it was around seventh grade and then into eighth grade that then I started thinking, there's got to be something more, something more for me and from me to be able to say, well, what is this faith all about? And because my parents, uh, especially my mother, was involved with different organizations at our home parish, we would have priests come over once in a while to dinner. Or they would talk, my mother would probably talk about, oh, Father so and so was so great when Aunt Shirley's husband died, or when Cousin Tony, you know, had a baby, or whatever. And there were all these positive things about priests. And I thought, wow, that must be a wonderful way of life to help people, you know. Uh, in their own life, at, at times of death or sickness or the birth of a child. And so I think that impression, which was so positive, was encouraging to me because I always loved being with people. Uh, I grew up with kids in the neighborhood where we were always at my house or someone else's house and dancing, you know, to the music and American bandstand and whatnot. And but I always enjoyed being with people, not by myself. And so it just sort of went to another level. And so in eighth grade, I took the entrance exam for what in those days they called the minor seminary. So I entered the minor seminary as a freshman in high school, went through high school and two years of college at that seminary, then out to East Aurora, where I was for six more years, and then I was ordained. So if you, if you started to see priests as being doers of good, as being persons who could help in so many important ways in life around the seventh or eighth grade, you didn't exactly have the same progression as a lot of teenagers where they'll do what you did as a child, go to mass because mom and dad say so, and then they start experiencing doubts in high school and college, and sometimes they, they move away from the faith. Does this mean you didn't have doubts uh, as you were working through seminary? Um, were there times where you questioned whether you had made the right choice? How did those teenage and early young adult years, what were those like for you uh, as you were working through the seminary? Well, in the early stages of my seminary life, um, even then uh, I had a, uh, a um, well, people saw me, especially in authority, as sort of a rebel. <laughs> and not and regulations, and my mother even said one time, well, if you're not going to follow the rules, then leave the seminary and just do something else. Um, but for the most part, it, it was easy going, except academically. It was never good academically. But the interesting thing is after 10 and a half years of seminary training, spirituality, classes, etc., I went through a crisis of faith. I guess nobody escapes a crisis of faith, not even Roy. So I got to the point then, with a year, just over a year to go before ordination, after all those years in, in formation, that I was so much at a point where I was thinking of leaving the seminary, decided not to be a priest, and I didn't want to be a Roman Catholic or a member of any organized Christian religion. I, at that point, thought as though the church was more of a stumbling block to Christ's message than it was an invitation and sharing. And so I went through a real crisis of what do I do? Do I go on and you know, make it like a play a game? Do I make it real? Do I have the, the guts, whatever, spiritually, to leave it all behind? But it was a very dark time for me, a very challenging time for me. And so... One of my classmates said, well, Roy, if you're looking for advice, if you're looking for counseling, don't go to someone who's going to say, oh, Roy, I agree with you completely. That's right. You know, keep going. You know, you're on the right track. He said, go to somebody that you don't really respect or that thinks so much differently than you. Maybe get that person's perspective, which I did. 
and I got another perspective. <laughs> you know how wonderful the Holy Spirit, you know, works. And so then, well, here I am, fifty-two years after ordination, and never regretting a day of it. Always grateful that I received what I consider a call, or at least how I responded to uh, my desire to be, first of all, a better human being, secondly, a better Christian, and then thirdly, a better priest. But it's all like tied in. But my focus isn't just on me being a priest, or on me being a Christian, or on me being the human being that God created me to be, and how those other aspects then are a part of it and then work together with it. So as a priest, you've been fairly active in various uh, social justice movements, but then also uh, outreaches. How, uh, could you summarize for us some of the work that you've done? And then could you also explain what it is about that kind of work that you see as uh, being a calling, if you will? Uh, why is it that you... Uh, so much focus on this way of serving as a priest? Well, I suppose because, of course, Christ is the primary example um, of what it means to be there for everyone, especially the oppressed, the downtrodden. And you read the Psalms, especially in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, and uh, they're to free the prisoner, you know, and to bring justice to the widow and the orphan. And I guess that was so much a part of my being that it was not that I was looking for it, but whenever I would find it or see it, I had to be a part of it. And so when I, I remember when I was in the seminary and I was taking census in downtown Buffalo with another seminarian, and it was a primarily you know, a black you know, a neighborhood. And when my folks found out, I was like, Roy, what are you doing in that neighborhood? It's not safe here. How can you do that, you know? And so I said, no, come on, Mom, come on, Dad, I'd be okay. And it was at the beginning of what I saw in so many African-American families. Their faith put mine to shame. The strong faith they had despite how they were victims of racial prejudice, how they were left out of many ways of education and jobs that they would have been good at if conditions were other otherwise. And so that was like the beginning of saying, wow, I just feel as though, again, their faith is so strong, no matter what obstacles they face. And so I tried to learn from that. But then, again, gradually ever came along when I was at Our Lady of Lourdes, there was a group called Dignity, which was for gay Catholics. And they usually had other priests coming in to say mass, and uh, but I was the pastor, and I allowed you know that you know to take place until the bishop, of course, said no. So then they had to go underground, you know, to people's homes and apartments. But to say, well, their sexuality should not be a reason for you know us not to love them, because God still loves them. God created them. And he knew what they were going to be like and their sexual orientation. Then I got into the divorced and the separated and started a group called the Phoenix Club for people who felt uh, ostracized from the church when they got a divorce and didn't understand that, no, they can still go to communion, you know, as long as they don't get, you know, married, you know, outside the church. But then again, try to say to them, do you really think that Christ would say no to you? If in this relationship that you're in now, it's a much truer relationship, a much more loving relationship than that first one. That maybe that first marriage ceremony wasn't what God wanted of you, but this is the person God says is the right one for you. And why not in conscience then be able to be united with Christ in communion with his love? And then into the prison ministry, you know, and chaplain for 10 years in different correctional facilities, starting that house with Karen, Hope House. You know. But now, you know, much of my concentration, uh, especially with my, the last parish that I was in for 19 years, many Hispanic families were there. And so then I got to know some of the crises that they go through. They're not just language and being accepted, but some of the religious traditions, you know, that people would just sort of put aside and not respect. Obviously, then we get into refugees and immigrants. And so uh, I got involved with Aldivia La Casa, 
you know, and to see what they were doing for people who wanted to go to Canada through Buffalo. But then I and some others said, well, what about people who want to stay here in the United States? So then we started a house called Buffalo Peace House, which we house about 21 people from six or seven different countries, uh, giving them the, the uh, help that they need through uh, social agencies, through medical agencies, and of course through law, uh, you know, and, and for some with lawyers. And to say that now this is an area that I'm so, you know, um, in love with or, or want to be a part of, you know, to show people that, you know, they can find a home and I want to help them in whatever way. So it's just sort of one thing leads to another, you know, who knows what the next one may be, but I'm open to it. <laughs> <laughs> so you've mentioned Pope Francis a few times and with you going through all the various ministries that you've helped with, uh, I noticed a lot of overlap between the things that you have prioritized over your career as a priest and the things that Pope Francis has mentioned in addresses and encyclicals, uh, care for the immigrants, care for the racial and uh, ethnic uh, minorities that have been marginalized, especially by a Eurocentric church, uh, care for LGBTQ Christians. Um, given these similarities, do you think Pope Francis is trying to reorient the church in the right direction? Do you think he's trying to push the church to see uh, some new people that have been missed before? Um, what is it that you think Francis is trying to accomplish, and what do you think of that mission that he has? Okay, well, to me, I liken it to the Reformation, historically in the church, with the so-called protestation, the Protestant, okay, and this group breaking away because of political reasons or religious reasons, whatever. Uh, and to say then that's when some of the great saints came out. They came out to reform the church so that, you know, people wouldn't have so much to protest about or protest against and to get people back spiritually and, and morally and especially the leaders of the church you know, popes that had mistresses and illegitimate children, et cetera, et cetera. You know, or you know, buy your way to heaven. You know, give us some money and we'll pray you know, that you sold those to heaven. All that junk. And so, but the reformers said, let's get back to what Christ is about. And that to me is Pope Francis. All he's saying is, let's continue to reform ourselves to form the church that Christ established that do away with all this you know, power structure and uh, authority, you know, that you know, demeans people, rejects people. You know, we have more laws for us to reject people than we have reasons to accept people or invite people. And so Francis, you know, and I know the establishment, you know, some of the cardinals especially are so totally against him because He's stripping away some of their power, you know, and some of their authority, and, and they don't like that. But he just wants to say, come on, let's get real. What is Christ basically all about? And that's what he wants to be all about. He wants us to be all about. And so, yeah, as any time reforming or reformation comes, there are people who are either left out, you know, or, you know, find it, you know, against the grain for them who have been so comfortable, you know, for so long, you know, in their power, in their position, and to say, okay, we still, we need a Pope Francis. We have need a Pope Francis for a long time, you know, and I'm just so happy that you'd be alive at this time. And, and I don't make mistakes. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. We're human. But to say we have to overlook, we can recognize some of the mistakes possibly, overlook them, but also to say, but what is coming forth? What is being taught? What is being shared? What's being encouraged? Again, and not just for us as Roman Catholics under the Pope, but for the world, the universality, you know, the uh, Fratelli, you know, Fratelli, um, because my mind just went, now Tutti, Fratelli Tutti. <laughs> Never good with it. <laughs> you know, but to say, yeah, he gives a message for everybody outside of religion, but just humanity and the way God created us to be. So you talked about some of the things around the time of the Protestant Reformation, some of the issues in the church that drove the reformers to, to stand up and say, this isn't how Christianity ought to be. Um, 
so the Reformation had the selling of indulgences you mentioned. Um, it had a, uh, well, fairly sinful behavior on behalf of several popes. It had bishops uh, engaging in simony, uh, selling off bishoprics, selling off church land, all sorts of unfortunate bad corruption. Do you think mm -hmm. there are, in the same way, some established sins in the church today that Pope Francis and other reformers need to address? Do you think there are a couple, call them monolithic problems in the church that need the same sort of push that we saw previously, that need restoration to get the church back where she should be? Well, if we ever get through the points that are challenging us right now, <laughs> and that's like a mountain, you know, to try to overcome, um, I, I can't think of like one particular issue, um, but just to say we have to continually look at our conscience. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Again, as human beings, how do we use our faith to help us to understand that? To me, one of my most powerful moments of prayer is always with the Holy Spirit. Whether I'm counseling somebody, visiting somebody in the hospital, or obviously with a homily, I'll always say a prayer, come Holy Ghost, fill the heart of your faithful, and kindle in me the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and I shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. And I just need that, you know, so I'm going beyond myself, but open to maybe not what I think I should say or do, but hopefully what the Holy Spirit wants to do with me and through me, you know, for others. When people come to a, a priest for counseling, for advice, um, I think they're looking in some ways for what you pray uh, for, whether you're giving a homily um, or seeking out the Holy Spirit's guidance in, in other uh, situations. People are looking for that kind of inspiration. They're looking for a chance to have renewal. How do you approach those situations where people are putting their faith, their spirituality in your hands, so to speak, and saying, Father, help me. I don't know what to do with this. Uh, how is it that you try and help persons when they're coming to you uh, and saying, my faith is hard. I don't understand how to be close to God. I don't understand how to live out this gospel mission. What is your response to questions like those? Well, I guess part of it would be, as I just mentioned, I encourage them to pray to the Holy Spirit, you know, for the gift of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord that we hear about every confirmation. <laughs> but, you know, to ask for the Holy Spirit and in order to remind them, first of all, I feel honored that you trust me with your problem and that you have come to me looking for answers. I'll try to do what I can, but, you know, I'm not a professional psychologist or psychiatrist. I do have insights into life and relationships because of all the people I've dealt with for these, well, now 52 years. And so... Even though I may not, for example, be married. Some say, well, what would the priest be able to tell me about being married? Well, besides being involved with marriage encounter for a number of years uh, and working with other couples, again, just working with, you know, my own family, my own relatives, and to see the, their ups and their downs, their challenges, their failures. And so, I mean, I'm not ignorant of, although I'm not in, in a marriage, but have learned from other people and things that then I can, you know, share. And so I think I'll say, you know, now if you want to get together again, I'm always here for you. If I haven't done that much for you right now, uh, I'll refer you to a counselor through Catholic Charities or whatever. But in the meantime, you know, also be open to reading the scriptures reading the sacred scriptures, because maybe Christ is saying something to you through those words that Matthew wrote, or that, you know, Peter wrote, or that Paul wrote, or, you know, whoever. And uh, to say, whatever your concept of God is, don't let that um, frustrate you to the point of, well, I don't really know. Well, at least go through the motion. You know, as I tell people, like even with the relationships, 
We don't have a really like that person. Please go through the motion you know, to be polite or to be kind. Again, that's a new ministry. I have to, you have to say that you're a BFF, you know, best friends forever. Uh, but at least just act as if you're doing what you should be doing. And so, you know, through their own prayer, you know, some people might say, well, I never was a good prayer. I'll start now. <laughs> well, but I, I don't know how to pray the rosary. Well, okay, I can show you how to pray the rosary, but, you know, there may be just all you need to do is just close your eyes, find a quiet space in your apartment, your home, whatever, or in the car as you're driving, and just say, Lord, I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm open. Do you have something to tell me? You know, oh, sure, God's going to talk to me. I'm going to hear a voice. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, you're not going to hear voices, I hope. Uh, but what you're going to do is you're going to have that feeling, that awareness. And it's almost like an aha moment. <laughs> yeah, I never, never thought about that. But, geez, okay, thanks. So I have just different methods according to the person or what their background has been, you know, church-wise, you know, positive or negative. So now let's take a little bit more of a, a bird's eye view, let's say, of, of your time as a priest. In your 50-some years, what has been the most difficult thing that you have faced uh, as a priest? Well, <laughs> the most difficult is the most recent. Um, as you know, many people know, that I, along with others, was charged as being a pedophile priest, okay? And I, I'll i never forget that day I went, I got a call from the chancery to go to see them, and I thought that maybe they wanted me, having been retired, to maybe go back into a parish again. So I'm thinking about excuses <laughs> to say, no, I'm not going to be a pastor again. I don't want to be a pastor. So anyway, so that they say, oh, by the way, so-and-so has charged you you know, with raping him and molesting him when he was just eight years old. And I mean, you could blow me over, you know, with a, a feather, as they say. So I was very fortunate. I was fortunate because I could prove all the lies that this individual came up with, that he didn't go to the school he said he did. I was never at the church that he said that all this was happening, you know, until like maybe 15, 20 years later. I had proof from the family where he said I was doing all this stuff, you know, that I never had a key. I never had access to the home. Uh, it wasn't the house as he describes it, which you can find out currently on Google, you know, with the maps. But it didn't look like that, you know, way back when all this was taking place. So I was fortunate. But I went through hell. I mean, I couldn't celebrate Mass, couldn't do anything as a priest. And, and then had my reputation just destroyed. Because even when I pr was proven to be innocent, certain people that I had been helping and was ministering to would have nothing to do with me again. Well, because maybe he got off on a technicality. Or maybe he really is, but, you know, they can't prove it. And so there are still people who just, you know, like, turn the other way or talk about me, you know, behind my back. So, I mean, all those years I tried to do nothing but help people, reach out to people, be kind and compassionate. And then somebody, for the sake of money, you know, decides as soon as he heard that the diocese had millions of dollars to spend on these cases, decides to charge me. And uh, it, it was just the darkest moment of my life. In moments like that, when you as a priest have dedicated... Uh a large part of your life to God, did that, did that affect your relationship with God? Did that make it harder for you to uh, come to God? Did you wonder, why is this happening to me, Lord? Or were those moments that actually pushed you closer to God because you felt you had nowhere else to go? I would say yes, that I would push me closer to God. But with who am I not to go through, you know, a crucifixion or a cross. I mean, you know, Christ even said, you know, to, to his followers, you know, get ready to carry your own cross. And some of the greatest saints that we have historically through all these centuries had horrible, you know, things that they had to live through. And 
so again, who am I to say that I'm, I could escape that? But when it came, I know I needed help, you know, and so I went to God. But the other blessing was, so referring back to what I mentioned a while ago, God works through people. Not only my relatives, but some of the parishioners that, you know, in my last parish or other parishes where I had been, we're there. Roy, we know you didn't do that. You're not that kind of a priest. We're with you all the way. If you need any financial help with lawyers, if you need just a place to, to hang out or to come for supper or whatever, we're here for you. We love you. And, you know, that's God working through those men, those women, in a way to remind me that what I had done for so many years was in vain. It was not in vain. And so these people are to say, you know, we are your support, you know, and we know that God, you know, will help you through all of this. Let's take another uh, long-term look at what you have done as a priest, but from a more positive lens. Would you say there's one thing during your entire career as a priest that has been most rewarding, most fulfilling? I would say probably my ministry in corrections uh, as a prison chaplain. The odd adage there, but for the grace of God go I, came to mind so often. And I would see these men and talk about not judging. Okay, okay, accepting, you know, whatever it was that they did, okay, to say, well, if I was in that same situation, I had the same family situation, neighborhood situation, lack of employment, bad education, uh, poverty, victim of racism, etc., 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 who am I to say that I wouldn't have just maybe decided to maybe sell drugs so that I could have food for my baby? you know, or to support this woman that I love. Who's to say that I wouldn't join a gang to survive because some other gang is going to, you know, try to kill me. And so I need support from some other gang, you know, to, to protect me. You know, it, it, do I really think that I would be so noble, <laughs> so pure, so holy, whatever, that I would resort to that? No. You know, so it taught me a lot. And not to judge people, as I say, unless you walk a mile in their moccasins. Uh, so unless you go through what they went through, and that is an excuse, but as an insight, as an understanding, you know, that I might be in the next cell. You know, so I, that was the, the big lesson for me, and, and to help me again to be therefore less judgmental of other people, even in much smaller matters, not just in you know, the correction system. But that was a very powerful time in my life that God really spoke to me. And what some people say is, oh, why would you want to be in a ministry like that? Uh, I think God knew what he was doing, <laughs> you know, and had me in the right place at the right time. And I'm a better person, you know, and a better priest because of it. So I have one last question for you today, Father Roy. Um, hmm. I've been asking uh, my, my interviewees about whether or not they have some sort of uh, daily uh, ritual, some sort of schedule they follow every morning of things that they do. And I've been asking about that because I want to see if we can come up with something for someone's faith life, for someone's spiritual life that's analogous to, you know, having your morning cup of coffee or, or brushing your teeth after breakfast. So do you have one uh, concrete thing that is... Uh, a morning cup of coffee for someone's spiritual life you could share with us? Well, for me, of course, it's the same thing for any priest, you know, that we are uh, obliged to pray the bravery, the office, the liturgy, the hours. And so, especially that's the way that I begin, you know, my morning. Um, and especially now with the help of uh, iPads, etc., and, and with the right app, <laughs> I can use my iPad to do my praying with the bravery. And the nice thing is, of course, if, if it's the feast of a saint, then you can, you know, uh, try to find out what's, what was that saint's life all about. So that's like daily, you know, opportunities for me to say, oh, wow, she went through that, or he did that, or whatever. And so again, it's that, that person, another human being, another person of faith, and what can I learn from him or her? And go back to the scriptures uh, with, again, the, the Psalms or, you know, whatever the particular uh, New Testament reference might be. 
And I say, well, God, speak to me today. Is there something you want me to hear? Is there something that you want me to learn? And so to be open to that. So at least I have that advantage because I've been doing that for well over 52 years because even in the seminary, you know, we would pray. And, uh, but yeah, that that's, you know, that's what kickstarts the, the day for me. I don't drink coffee, so I need something like this. <laughs> All right. Thank you very, very much for your time, Father Roy. And again, thank you to everyone who's joined us today and for all of our uh, interviews. Um, this is the end of our series. We're very grateful for everyone who has come uh, to hopefully learn a little bit from your peers at the Newman Center, from, from some of our students, and from also uh, some of the religious that we have serving with us. So thank you again to everyone. And we hope to see you very soon again at the Newman Center. Uh, until then, everyone stay safe.